Hi, it's Christina. Today I'm going to be making sourdough starter. In fact, I'm going to be making five different sourdough starters, each one from a different flour type. So I'll review with you the differences between each different flour type and how it behaves as the sourdough starter matures, and I'll document the progress in a summary video so that you can see and know what to expect depending on which flour type you choose to use. So today I'm going to be making sourdough starter from pumpernickel, medium rye, spelt, white whole wheat, and all-purpose flour. Right now we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, so a lot of people are having a hard time finding flour at their local supermarket. So it's my hope that you have access to at least one of these different flour types in your own kitchen or at your local grocery store that you can use to start your own sourdough starter. A quick refresher on what sourdough is, it's cultivating the wild yeast that exists in your flour and in your natural environment that you can use for your bread to rise. And yeast has a symbiotic relationship with lactobacillus bacteria that completes the culture. If you have access to whole grain flour, like rye or wheat, that's really the best that you can use to start your sourdough starter. There's a lot more flora on it, so it's going to mature a lot quicker than if you use a more refined flour like all-purpose flour. Any of these flours you can use to start your starter, and then once it matures, you can maintain it using all-purpose flour to feed it. And then you can manipulate that starter for however you want to use in any type of bread that you want to bake. So the first flour type that I'm going to review is rye. So rye is similar to wheat, but it is a different grain. It's typically grown in cooler climates or in places with poorer soil conditions. In medieval times, the peasants or poorer country people would have more access to rye flour, so they would use that in their baking a lot. Prior to modern food standards, there would be occasionally challenges with rye flour that it would become infected with fungus and then people would get this condition known as ergotism. Now ergotism can cause convulsions and gangrene and psychosis and mania. And throughout history, when you see spikes of the condition of ergotism, it correlates with the witch trials. So spikes in ergotism and spikes in the Salem witch trials kind of jive together Together, which is kind of an interesting historical context to think about, especially for us New Englanders that are very well versed in the Salem witch trials. So I think with modern food standards, that's pretty much eradicated. If you find rye flour from a reputable source, I don't think you're going to have to worry about any type of ergotism infection. So Rye flour comes in three different types. You can buy pumpernickel. It's the entire rye berry, so it includes the inner portion, the endosperm, and all of the outer hard portion, the bran. So when you use pumpernickel flour, it's darker because it has more bran in it. And the flour itself has little teeny tiny speckles of the bran that you can see. To be the most active because of the um, flora that's on the bran compared to any other type of rye flour. Medium rye includes the endosperm and some of the bran, whereas white rye is primarily the endosperm that you're using. So the more of the bran and the more of the whole grain that you're using, the more active your starter is going to be. Rye, when you bake, behaves very differently. It's lower in gluten than wheat is if you're used to using all-purpose or bread flour or wheat flour. Baking with rye is a lot different. You have uh, a denser product at the end, more of an enzyme called amylase, which, help, which breaks down starches. So you have to be careful of overrising that type of dough and preventing starch attacks, things like that. It's also richer in polysaccharides. So two of my starters are going to be from rye. I'm going to be using pumpernickel, which is the whole grain rye, and then I'm going to be using medium rye, which includes some of the bran, but not all of the bran like pumpernickel flour would have. The third starter I'm going to be making is using whole wheat flour. I'm going to be using white whole wheat flour. At the store, in normal times, you usually have the option of buying red 
red whole wheat or white whole wheat. If you like that weedy flavor, you're probably more apt to be purchasing the red whole wheat. It's more of a robust flavor. And if you like a more milder flavor of wheat, you probably would gravitate more towards the white whole wheat. They have very similar nutritional properties to them. It's really just your flavor profile that you're looking for. The wheat flour, when it's first milled, often doesn't have an odor at all. So as the wheat starts to break down, it develops more of an odor. So if your wheat flour is very pungent, it's actually probably rancid. Wheat is grown in uh, drier climates. And when you have whole grain flour at home, whether it's rye or whole wheat or spelt or whatever type of whole grain flour you're using, it's best to store it in an airtight container and in your refrigerator. Since these flours are more active and the oil from the bran comes in contact with the endosperm, it spoils a lot quicker than a more refined flour like all-purpose or bread flour does. So I usually keep mine in my freezer for long-term storage. The fourth type of starter I'm going to be using is made with all-purpose flour. It's the most common flour that you can find, but it is the most refined. So I'm fully anticipating that that starter is going to take a longer time for it to mature than pumpernickel, rye, whole wheat, and spelt. Lastly, I'm going to be using spelt flour. So spelt is an ancient grain. It's been around since the Bronze Age. It is very similar to wheat. It has a little bit less gluten than wheat does. It's a lot harder than wheat is, so it's tougher to mill down. So that's why you don't see spelt a lot in commercial baking, but with artisan breads, spelt is kind of making a resurgence right now. So it, you might be able to find spelt flour at your local grocer if you can't find traditional bread flours, all-purpose flours, wheat flours, things like that. So the vessels that I'm going to be using to be placing my sourdough starter in are glass jars. And I'm going to be placing the lid just on them loosely. You don't need any air to feed your culture. The lactobacillus and the yeast don't need any oxygen to survive. The reason why I'm just gonna leave the cover on loosely is for the carbon dioxide that the starter will omit to escape and not cause the contents to be under pressure. As your sourdough starter starts to mature, the pH level is going to drop considerably. So that means your sourdough starter is going to become a very acidic environment. That's good news because it means that some of the bad bacteria that can contaminate your starter won't be able to survive in that acidic environment. So your yeast and your lactobacillus bacteria are really good at protecting their own environment because the pH level is so low in an active starter. When we're just starting out with sourdough, we don't quite yet have that acidic pH level of a mature starter. So when we're just starting our starter, we're going to be very careful looking for signs of contamination. So every time I feed my sourdough starter, I'm going to be looking for any streaks of color. Oftentimes it's orange or red or pink and any type of odor that I wouldn't expect. The odor that I would expect from a sourdough starter might be a little bit fruity, might smell a little bit like yogurt or sourdough and those are healthy smells. I don't want to smell anything foul. If you see any color or have any foul odor, just throw it all out and start fresh. So today we're going to be using all-purpose flour, white whole wheat flour, spelt flour, medium rye, and pumpernickel flour. The different flour types, the all-purpose is more refined, it's very white. The white whole wheat is a little bit more tan. Organic spelt. Rye. And the pumpernickel, see if I can get you to see that. But you can see the little specks of the bran in the flour. So to make our sourdough starter, we're going to be using 113 grams of flour to 113 grams of water. If you don't have a food scale available to you, that's one scant cup of flour to a half a cup of water. So the first flour that I'm going to be mixing into a starter is King Arthur's flour, all-purpose flour. And I have 113 grams of flour in here, which is the equivalent to one scant cup. 
I am going to be adding 113 grams of water and I'm using bottled water just to control the water across the um, different starters that I'm using. You can certainly use your own tap water as long as it doesn't smell a lot of chemicals or as long as it's not a reverse osmosis system. So I'm going to pour in 113 grams. Whoops of water. We got 111. That's close enough. Make sure that you get any of your dry spots. Check the bottom, fold it a couple of times to make sure it's well incorporated. And this is what the all-purpose starter looks like. I'm using white whole wheat flour from King Arthur. And again, I'm going to be pouring in 113 grams of water, which is a half a cup. And mixing to incorporate. Making sure get all of the dry spots. So this is a stiffer starter compared to the all-purpose starter and it's a tanner color. The next I'm going to be mixing is spelt. I'm using whole grain spelt. And I'm going to be adding in 113 grams of water. Mixing. And spelt turns a little bit more gummy. It's softer than the wheat. It has less gluten. It has less structure to it. It's related to wheat, but does have very different properties to it, so it will be a very different texture. It's softer, looks a little more wet than the wheat does. So this is the spelt compared to the wheat, compared to the all-purpose. Next, I'm going to be mixing rye. This is the flour type that I'm using. I'm going to be adding 113 grams. The whole grains tend to soak up a little bit more water than the more refined flours do, so you're going to find that rye, pumpernickel, wheat are going to be drier than all-purpose. So as the rye or wheat or pumpernickel 
start to become more active, some of the signs you're going to be seeing are more cracks rather than bubbles, whereas all purpose you're gonna be seeing more bubbles. So this is what medium rye looks like compared to wheat, compared to spelt, compared to all purpose. Lastly, I'm going to be using pumpernickel. And then with the pumpernickel, they have the little bits of the bran in it, so you're going to see some flex. It's a darker color, it's going to be dry. So it's a thicker kind of pasty consistency. That's what it looks like pumpernickel compared to rye, compared to wheat, compared to spelt, compared to all purpose. So I'm going to be placing these in glass jars with the lids screwed on loosely to ferment. We're going to feed it in 24 hours and we'll take a look at the activity at that point and I'll see you soon.